instead of like a, a thicker, like a lot of Euro leaders start with like a, a 20 pound butt or like a, a 16, 12, maybe even eight would be light. This whole thing is for, you know, a four pound test essentially, right? Four X, like it's very thin. Uh, and so it, it just doesn't get blown around quite as much in the wind. Right. Uh, so that's an advantage. And the third advantage that I would do uh, is I'd overweight my flies. That was Russ Miller with a few tips on casting a Euro setup, some big bonus Euro nipping tips, a brief history through flies and the Umqua story today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how you doing? Thank you for stopping by the show today. We've got a new trivia section going on here at the end of some of the episodes. Uh, you can go to wetflyswing.com slash trivia, trivia, and check it out. And you can win some swag and some good stuff there. And you can see if you can answer some questions coming up here. Angler's Coffee roasts a full range of coffees with one goal in mind, delivering excellent coffee to every single angler. With a blend for every taste, a dry dropper on the go tea bag option, and a roast sampler, you know Joe at Angler's has you covered. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash anglers to support a sustainable company with unsurpassed taste. That's Angler's, A-N-G-L-E-R-S. Lake Lady Rods builds distinctive custom rods, each created one at a time to the exact specifications for you. Lake Lady only uses world-class, top-of-the-line products and components. Just ask some of the governors, senders, and generals Chris has uh, produced rods for in the past. Pretty amazing stuff. These rods are crafted to be the most sensitive tool you could ask for. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash lakelady to check out this one-of-a-kind custom rod. That's wetflyswing.com slash lake lady. Russ Miller is here to share the full story of Umqua Feather Merchants and how much of the history in fly fishing can be told through the history of fly tying and fly patterns. This is some, uh, some real cool stuff. Russ has a nice little presentation going on. We're gonna dig into it today. He also walks us through some of the crazy stories at Umqua back in the day, including how the royalty program first got going. And uh, it's a good one. Hope you enjoy this. Uh, we're even going to hear about the Roadkill Grill. So without further ado, here is Russ Miller. How you doing, Russ? I'm very good. Thanks for having me on, Dave. Yeah, thanks for thanks for doing this. This has been another cool one because it's been a long time coming. We, I think we connected. Well, I know we connected IFTD a long time ago. I think, and I'm not sure if you're going this year and who's all going to be there. But, uh, but yeah, we're finally circling around and putting this together. How are things going? Things are going very well. Just staying uh, extremely busy and yeah, finding time to get out on the water and uh, yeah. talk about fishing every day. It's good. Life's good. That's good. And you have a bunch of things going on because I think, and I can't remember. Yeah. I think you were with Umqua back in, I think, what was it? 2019 when we, when we connected. Sounds about right. Yep. I just started there and yeah, I've got, uh, it, it feels like a lifetime ago at this point. I know. I know it does. And you have a bunch of things going on from the, you know, kind of the Euro nymphing and all, all that. So there's a whole bunch of things we're going to dig into. And I think we're going to dig into Umqua, a little bit of history there. But let's start. I always like to go back to the beginning really quickly. Just just talk about how you first got into fly fishing. They will take it into everything else. Yeah. Um, uh, my grandfather was a big fisherman and, you know, saltwater stuff. So we, we used to... We used to spend summers out in uh, on the on the Outer Banks in North Carolina, and really just got into fishing. and uh, And I grew up in the Midwest, did a lot of fishing there, right? Mostly all conventional. And then uh, we spent a, a family vacation out in Steamboat Springs, and while we were out there in Steamboat, uh, we decided to try fly fishing on the Yampa, and. Uh, I don't have it anymore, but we got a, an awesome little Walmart combo set up for, you know, like 50 bucks or something like that. And I don't think I've had fishing that good. I'm sure it's a, you know, the memory of it, but we were, it was, we were slamming fish. It was so much fun. Yeah. Did you say the Umqua? 
Uh, no, sorry, the Yampa. Oh, the Yampa. Yep, just outside of Steamboat Springs there. It runs through Steamboat, and we were camping on the Yampa and uh, catching little rainbows. And uh, and that was kind of my first introduction to fly fishing. I brought the rod up back to the Midwest with me and caught a bunch of panfish and caught a bunch of bass on it and then moved out uh, west for college to Boulder, CU Boulder. Uh-huh. Yep. And uh, man, just went off the deep end. Yeah, that's where it happened. That's where, yeah, that's where it just was like, all right, this is altering the course of my life. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And what is Boulder to somebody that hasn't been there? Why, why is Boulder, Colorado, that such, it seems like, you know, obviously that's a hot spot. Is that what it felt like to you? Like everybody was fly fishing? Well, if, all right. So if you're coming from the Midwest and you were to just drive West, you have the exact same scenery all through the state of Iowa, all through the state of Nebraska. And then halfway through the state of Colorado, bam, you hit Boulder <laughs> and uh, the front range, right? And it just like yeah. the mountains just begin there. So for someone coming from the flatlands, it was, you're like, holy cow, we're here. We're in the mountains, right? And right. even though, you know, you're, you're totally on the front range of the state. And the other really unique thing about Boulder is that, uh, you have super athletes that live in that, that town. Like, uh, right. you know, people that are like, Oh yeah, like you run into someone at dinner and you're like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm doing this or training for this Olympic event. You're like, what? Uh, right. And, and so you get mixed with all these, these incredible people. And the same it holds true with anglers, right? Like, um, I was working at, at front range anglers, uh, after college and, you know, you would just meet people that are like, Oh yeah, I'm, I'm a permit guy. And you're like, Oh cool. Like that, that seems like a fun one. He's like, no, no, no. This is like, my 10th trip of the year. Like I'm a permit right. guy. And so you meet these people that are extremely, extremely into it. And, uh, one of the guys I was working with was actually on the U S national team. And that was kind of uh, my right. whole intro to, to comp fishing. Uh, and it's that same thing where it gets that, that extremely high level individual, uh, in Boulder and, uh, Rob Kalanda, you know, I was, you know, you kind of get a little cocky in your post-college days and, think you're the man right and yep. rob was just like hey man you should come out and do one of these you know you're getting pretty good and i said yeah man i'd love to come out and do <laughs> one and the first tournament i did man i i don't know why i went back i got beat so bad uh it was like it was like a miracle that i didn't come dead last and it was just uh, it was incredibly humbling and i said well i clearly don't know anything that i thought i knew these guys know well above and beyond um what I really do understand. And, and that was kind of how I got into competitive fishing. It was mostly to like, uh, partly ego, right? Like I, I didn't want to be that bad. And the other side of it, which, which is still the reason I continue to do it is like, you learn so much, uh, and you learn about trout behavior. You learn about water, you learn about, you know, almost every little detail, uh, cause it all really matters, especially when you're putting yourself against the measuring stick and, you know, whether you ever want to put yourself against a measuring stick or not, that style of fishing really gives you so many data points to be able to refine your angling in a way that I was ne never able to experience just kind of like recreational fishing and replicating what I liked to do and what I thought was successful. Right. So. Uh, so, yeah, Boulder was uh, Boulder was awesome. I loved my time in Boulder. And then uh, my wife and I moved out to Seattle. And hmm. in Seattle, uh, all I wanted to do was, was, uh, really learn how to swing flies for steelhead with the long rod. And, um, you know, that, that history of that part of the sport, like the, the two handed casting and presentation of flies and even the style of flies, you know, was so raw. Like you'd run into people on the river and be like, Oh my gosh, I, I was reading about you in a book about like pioneering this stuff like oh yeah well you can get in behind me if you'd like and i'm like oh i'm just i'm just gonna watch i think and nice. and uh and so i really got into steelhead fishing out there and you know it really turned into this like perfect harmony in my life with you know this yin and yang where i had trout fishing which was all about competitions and like maximizing success and like really uh, going deep 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 into the fine points of everything and then I had swinging flies, which was all about the experience and, you know, chasing fish with friends. And, uh, it was a very nice balance in my life, um, with that and kept me fishing all year long, which was, which was really great. That's cool. Yeah. And then my wife and I decided, uh, she finished her, her education out there, got some residency offers in the Puget Sound. And ultimately, uh, she looked at me and said, I cannot do more 
more winters uh, and more rain in the Pacific Northwest. Oh, wow. And so we decided yeah. to move back to Colorado and, uh, and we now live in Golden. Wow. And, and that's how I uh, reconnected with, with Colorado and, and got working here at Uncle Feather Merchants. And that's it. Yeah. You are the exact example of the, to show you, you know, the Northwest, you know, it takes a certain person to live in the rain, even though it's like not quite as cold probably as Colorado in the winter. It's still, it's just rains a lot. And Colorado has a lot of sun, right? It does. Like it, we got, I don't know how many inches we got like six, eight inches, uh, two nights ago. And like, you know, shovel the driveway, shovel the deck. They're, they're bone dry. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I was not, I, the rain never bothered me. Right. Because well, the rain brought salmon and steelhead into the rivers and exactly. You know, it's it's way different if you look forward to the rain versus like, oh, it's another day where I have to gear up to go outside. Um, that's right. You know, that's right. Perceptions, everything. Yeah, that's what it is. Totally. I hear you. No, that's cool. So basically you are I mean, Colorado is the thing that got you going. And then you went back to Colorado and, and then um, and you're still doing the competitive fishing and, and the Umqua. So talk about that. So you Umqua. How did that opportunity uh, present itself? And then talk about what you're doing now. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was uh, when we originally moved back, I was working for Fish Pond, and um, I was chatting with one of one of my really good buddies who's on on the U.S. team with me, or used to be. He he uh, intentionally stopped doing it um, just because it is such a huge life commitment and. Uh, he's got a, a new daughter, uh, Josh Grafham, uh, who runs our sales over here at Umpqua. And I was chatting with him, and he was like, "Hey, man, have you ever thought about coming and working for us?" I was like, "Well, no." He's like, "Well, yeah, you, you should." And uh, it was kind of one thing led to another, and uh, I was sitting in front of Jeff Fry over the CEO, and just kind of like talking about how I, you know, and, and it's funny because now we're gonna we'll talk about our almost 50th anniversary here in a little bit. Yeah, exactly. I, was, I was sitting in my interview and I was just like, man, I, I think it's incredible. Like, uh, you know, I was, I had my hand on, on the catalog and I was like, we're truly within the pages of this is the modern history of fly fishing. And I think that's incredible from like a, a, a storytelling and a brand perspective. And, and he ended up hiring me. Right. And, uh, and I've always hmm. wanted to kind of run, run a team. Uh, and so we've got, a uh, small, nimble team over at Umqua that uh, as our marketing department, and I get to run that. And that's kind of always been my uh, one of the things I've always wanted to do within this little industry, right? Like, you you get to develop your own kind of personal flavor of what you really believe fly fishing is and what resonates. And and I've, I I really love getting to work with my guys to help kind of bring those those visions to reality uh, as a brand. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, so that's what I get to do with uh, for Umqua and and about a thousand other things, especially over the last two years. Is you know, I guess yep. I have like six hats sitting on my desk, and I throw on different ones for meetings, and uh, it's a yep. lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. It keeps <laughs> me busy. That's it. That's good. So now we're in Umqua, and we're going to dig probably at the before we get out of here more into some of the you know euro nipping, competitive fishing, and things like that. But I want to talk. I want to hear a little about the history because the Umqua thing is really interesting to me and how it all came to be. So it's the 50th anniversary. Talk about, let's do a little brief history. Take us back on Umqua and talk about, you know, I know you know a little bit of it there because it started out as kind of a, you know, you hear some of the stories of the old, uh, the dingy old place and now what it is. So how did it come to be? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I'll just like really set the stage here. Yeah. And for anyone who doesn't know, Umqua, and it's not, uh, it's not, you know, I've heard it pronounced about a 10,000 different ways. Umqua, it is a, it is a uh, Native American word, right, um, for tumbling waters, right? And it describes the uh -huh. Umqua River, right? Um, yep. And, and so Umqua Feather Merchants was really founded on the banks of the North Umqua River. And it was a love of steelhead that, uh, that brought Dennis Black, the founder of Umqua, to the river. And, and really the whole thing in a, in a nutshell, what Umqua really did to, to change really, and, and I, it, it sounds overstated, but it, it truly is not, change the industry was to deliver uh, bulk flies uh, to retailers from coast to coast. Because if we were to roll back the clocks and we look at the 60s into the 70s, you had regional tires filling the bins for 
their their local fly shop, right? Mm -hmm. And yep. fly fishing at the time was was entering into its first real phase of like growth, and regional tires could no longer supply the fly shops. So by the time it was peak season, fly bins were empty, and you could not get flies. And Dennis, mm -hmm. as a commercial tire himself, quickly realized that this was a huge opportunity and not only that, but a huge problem. Right. And so, uh, he did a test run and I, 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 again, I can go way into this stuff. I probably talk for an hour on this, yep. but like, uh, he did a test run and he said, cool, I'm going to tie all winter long. And it was him and Randall Kaufman tying at the time commercially. And, uh, and, and they were tying and they put a boom box in between them. Right. And they'd listen to the radio and just crank out flies and, uh, and, and they'd crank out flies and then they'd go steelhead fish and they'd come back and crank out more flies. And they did that for a whole winter, and they said, "Well, here's here's the plan. They had a uh, they had a little Volkswagen bus, uh, a red one, and they said they said we're going to drive up to West Yellowstone, and we're going to go in August when they're out of flies, and demand is there. Hmm. And they sold all of their flies at the first stop, and they were like, "All right, cool, this is real." Uh, and so so they go back and they keep tying flies, and they 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 again they had that boombox, and these two are racing each other. How many how many can you tie during you know fortunate sun? kind of thing right and what year is this uh this would have been uh, 69 70 right oh wow amazing and so you know you've got two hippies that are time flies right yeah and you know they used to do these runs all the way back to the east coast orvis was their biggest customer right oh, so wow. they were tying commercially for so they drive out to orvis drop off the flies and then just like with a, a van full of cash road trip back fly fishing, <laughs> meeting people along the way, making these connections oh my gosh. and then go back to Oregon and tie flies. And, and anyway, they're, so they're listening to, you know, how many, how many things you can get through in the song, right? You know, so the song starts and they, boom, yeah. I got through three. How many did you get through? Ah, man, I, I didn't quite get three done. Uh, you know, and I mean, they're like ripping flies. And he said, well, wouldn't it be Randall introduced this side? Randall Kaufman, he's the guy that came up with the stimulator, uh, which is still one of yep. Ump was top selling attractor dry flies. Um, and, and he's like, dude, wouldn't it be cool if, uh, if you got a royalty for your fly creations, just like these guys get a royalty for every time a song comes on the radio. Hmm. Right. And that was where that first, uh, concept of a signature fly program or a royalty fly program was introduced Two buddies, time flies racing each other. Right. And like, wouldn't it be cool if, and, um, and so that idea really came to fruition in 1972, uh, when Dennis Black pitched Dave Whitlock. Uh, at the Federation of Fly Fishers said, hey, um, I've got this new idea. I'd like to produce your flies overseas, and I'd like to pay you a royalty for each one of your flies, uh, or each dozen we sell, right? And so, so you have skin in the game, and mm -hmm. we can use your name to promote Uncle Feather Merchants. And you know, Dave Whitlock at the time, this, this, you know, obviously social media didn't exist. Like, there were a handful of names, and Dave Whitlock still is one of a handful of names, uh, and he was the name back then. And, and Dave chuckled. He was like, get out of here. There's no way. Uh, because at the time, right, if we roll back the clock and we look at flies that were produced overseas, they were utter garbage. I mean, like coming oh, unraveled right. as you're false casting them. Catch a fish, throw it out, right? So the perception was like, are you going to produce flies overseas? Like, yep. I'm not putting my name next to a piece of garbage. And people are going to be like, oh, Dave Whitlock. Right. What a guy. <laughs> so what Dennis had done that Dave did not know is he had spent about a year living overseas, training tires to tie flies exactly the way he tied flies. And, and not only how to tie the flies, but using materials that he would use, right? And so he pulls out a box. He said, well, well, well let me show you. Let me show you. I, I actually have a couple. And he showed Dave. And Dave said, you got to be kidding me. I'm in. And so Dave Whitlock was the first royalty tire ever signed. And Uncle produced his flies and, and sold them. And, uh, and that's kind of, and it, and it really grew from there. It grew from there. What was that, that first royalty? Because I know that's come up a couple times on the royalties. What, what was it when Dave started? What do you mean? Or like, what was the royalty? What did, what did uh, Umqua pay Dave for a fly? 10%. Oh, 10%. And is that still the same way it is today? Uh, it's 8% now. Yeah, eight percent. So that's it. So it it hasn't changed much since nineteen seventy two. Exactly. So that's it. So it's ten eight ten percent, and and so from there you get Dave. And yeah, and then it's just a matter of over the years you get pretty much. I mean, it seems like almost everybody, or how, I guess it's not everybody, but you guys select 
tires or how does that process work? Uh, yeah, like our, our, our process is pretty interesting. Uh, so like by the end of, let me just get there real quick. By the end of the, uh, I've got a whole presentation on this, but by the end of the eighties, you know, it was literally everybody because, uh, the other, the other side of this, when you say everybody, like uncle back in the eighties had, I would say everybody that mattered. Yeah. I mean, you had Larry right. Dahlberg, uh, you had, uh, you right. know, Lefty Cray, Bob Clauser, George Anderson, AK best. I mean, it was, I, I, uh, Shane Stalkup. I mean, like truly everybody, um, you know, Chico Fernandez, uh, Gotcha. And if you mattered in fly fishing, you were going to, you were in. And part of it was like, you were already tying these flies commercially. And like, you know, Mike Lawson was on the list, obviously. Um, Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so you were tying these flies anyway. And you said, well, Jesus, someone else can tie these for me and they're going to do as good of a job and they're going to pay me. And I think that was one of the biggest things is that, um, uncle was, was true to their word. No, like, uh, sorry, uh, you know, no, no, they weren't, they weren't joking around with anyone. Like, Hey, we sold this many and here's your royalty check quarterly. Um, no, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, no, sorry. Uh, we're, we're a little short this month. Every quarter you got paid. Um, and so, yeah. you know, the, everyone really kind of was, was in then. I mean, like, you know, again, like the guys like Dan Blanton, right? Like, um, Bob Quigley, Rennie hair up, like Gary Borger. Uh, it was, uh, the list was super impressive and it was like, uh, you know, everyone was entering into the heyday. And it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. And so, so that same process today, then, then we were approached by a lot more tire. It was, it was different then. Uh, the way it works now is that we still get, uh, we get submissions and we do rolling submissions. So we do, we do four quarterly reviews and we have a fly committee, uh, which, which I'm lucky enough to get to sit in on. And they're in this committee we review every, every submission that comes across uh, our desks and get sent into Umpqua. So nothing kind of like, ah, this is whatever. And you know, no one looks at it. Mm-hmm. And we sit there and we review it and we say, we really look and we say, all right, you know, this is a, uh, does this, does this dry fly float better or solve whatever problem or, you know, uh, and really not try to like, oh, is this just a variation of this or is this, right. and uh, which gotcha. gets difficult, right? But we really try to look for yeah. that, that innovative idea and, you know, the, the big 50th story with, with Umqua that, you know, I got to, it, for me, it was one of the coolest things I've gotten to do was, was to call up a lot of these really, you know, legendary figures within the sport and say, how did it, how did it happen? Tell me your story and how it relates to Umqua. And so I got to talk to a lot of these really incredible folks and, and the whole idea that we still look for today is innovation. And that really is what everyone brought to the table in a massive way was, was this was an innovative thing. And I, I told you that, you know, when I got hired, that modern history of fly fishing, you know, it's, uh, from my perspective, an angler's perspective, like it's not the, the rod company really takes a lot of credit for like, yeah, this is, this is the next big thing. You know what I mean? But, but what takes a lot less credit, uh, that deserves a heck of a lot more is like a fly, like I wanted to do this, uh, or I think they wanted this. So, so I made a fly, right? And uh, well, on that fly was uh, I'll use I'll use the you know the steelhead example, right? These guys yeah. wanted to fish intruders, right? These these right. really big gaudy flies because the grabs from the fish were incredible. And so it started with the idea of a fly, like, well, how big of a fly will they eat, right? And uh, and then it was like, all right, well. I like to fish this kind of fly in this kind of water. And it's like on a high bank. It's not necessarily like the gravel bar, which meant you can't like overhead cast or have these really big dig loops. So how do I start to create a fly line that will deliver a really big fly, right? Short, compact mass. Yeah. And then fly rod says, well, we, we, we can make a fly rod that casts that line and that fly really, really well. <laughs> right. And so like that, the idea of a modern history is like, well, the, the flies are really what started to change the way we right. rethink about each piece of our kit going That's back up point. to the rod. Uh, and it would be, you could see, are you the same thing with, you know, with small, delicate dry flies and stuff like that? Yeah. Or, or what about, uh, Euro nymphs? Uh, they absolutely. Right. Yeah. And, and so anyway, it's, I find it to be super interesting. And then like, if you go back <laughs> and you, you start going back into this, the seventies and eighties and nineties, uh, and even into the two thousands, like, 
the major introductions that Umqua made, like, um, you know, if you want to talk about Euronymph, like, you know, back in the, in the, in the mid nineties, uh, the gold bead was introduced by Umqua. Oh, right. We're so commonplace. Everything has a bead in it. If it goes under the water, right? <laughs> yep. Back in the nineties, 95 in particular, right? Like was the first year a bead was introduced on a nymph and they're like, they're great stories. Like, uh, I got, I got to chat with Mike Lawson, right? Um, uh, Henry's fork angler, like Mr. Dry fly, you know, the ranch, like, and, uh, and, and he was tying at the, the Federation, um, of fly fishers conclave in West Yellowstone. And he tells this great story. And if you guys have ever heard Mike Lawson talk, I won't do the voice, Yeah. but he, he yeah. has got a, a, such a unique voice and he's telling oh, me yeah. this story and he's like, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there tying flies and this guy comes walking in and he's like, he's like, there's been an empty desk next to me all morning. And this guy finally comes walking in and sits down, but he comes walking in with a, uh, with a gold painted head. Right. And so he's, he's got this, this all gold look to him. And, and Mike says in his head, he's like, well, there's a guy that's really got his act together. And he gives me a couple of these gold beads that I look back at him and he says, and he says, uh, he says, what fish in the right mind would eat these? Right. And, and, yeah. and Theo's like, oh, you know, he's, 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 he's a Dutchman. So he's like, oh, you know, like the, the, the fish go crazy for them. They're unbelievable. <laughs> and Mike's like, yeah, okay. Uh, thank <laughs> you. Like I'll, I'll be over here tying my dry flies. You stay over there with these things. And, you know, and, and, uh, and then talking with Theo, like he goes on, like, you know, Lefty Cray came up to him at that same, uh, same conclave. And, uh, and he did, you know, the, his little stories, they, you know, Lefty didn't believe his eyes. He said, Lefty's quote was, these little soldiers are lined up for battle. Uh, yep. and, and Theo said, well, why don't you take some? Why don't you take some and, and, and try them out? And Theo received a, a letter from him a month later saying I was fishing a big lake uh, and we were filming there, right? And I couldn't hook a fish to save my life. And I saw that funny fly with a big bead on it, tied it on, used it. First cast I hooked up on a big brown trout and you saved the day of filming. Um, oh, wow. And so, yeah, like, you know, Theo, Theo doesn't take credit. He's the guy that brought him to the States. He doesn't take credit for the, being the first one to ever put a bead on, on the fly, but he knew Dennis yeah. Black through New Zealand, uh, fly fishing out there. He gave Dennis some of these flies to take down to New Zealand for those for the for the trout there, and and Dennis and Randall in New Zealand were just like this is magic, truly magic, and brought him back and like you know Mike Lawson now he looks at the bead and he says man like it was probably one of the most pivotal things and now I have to convince people to cut off the bead flies and let's try to get a couple right. on dry flies. Um, so it's a, it, yeah. it's, it's totally crazy. And then, you know, the bead came in at the perfect moment because this was 1995 In 1993, the river runs through it was released. Right. Oh, wow. And so you had perfect. this influx of brand new anglers that wanted to go out and catch a trout. Well, you didn't have to learn how to cast anymore. You didn't have to learn how to, you know, really work the subtleties of a dry fly drift. You could put on an oh, indicator, wow. you could put on a gold bead nymph, water load, upstream cast catch a fish. So like from the, from what it actually did to change our industry again, like the gold bead was unbelievable and it was just available in gold to begin. Oh, right. So, you know, and CDC was another introduction in the nineties. Like, uh, Dennis was fishing with, with, uh, some of the folks from Japan, uh, with Tiemco. Uh -huh. And, uh, and he was getting out fish and he was like, I don't like to get out fish. What are you using? He said, oh, just, uh, little dry flies, little dry flies. And so he, Dennis puts on little dry flies. He's like, well, my catch rate isn't yours with little dry flies. And he said, you need to show me. And he showed him this fly and he said, what, what kind of feather is this? I've never seen it. Uh, and, and he said, well, this is, uh, it's called CDC, cold de canard, right? And, uh, Dennis said, I, can I have, can I have some flies? You know, it's kind of that, almost that scene out of River River. Yeah. like, Hey, come on, just give me, give All me right. one, give me one. Yeah. And, uh, and started matching, you know, Toshi's catch rate on this stuff and, and, and brought it back to the States. And, you know, and these Japanese tires aren't what our U S tires are. And, and so, um, you know, Dave Hall at the time was the Umquist fly guy, helped get all the flies and development work with signature tires. And Dave got a hold of this stuff and said, this stuff's crazy. And he gave it to Shane Stallcup, 
Mike Lawson and Renee Hero and say, guys, you got to check this stuff out. I think you're going to love it. And it was really those three individuals that started taking CDC, applying it to our Western hatches. And, and mm -hmm. again, like CDC, I, I don't know. For anyone who hasn't fished CDC flies, I can't recommend them enough. There's a property to it that Hackle doesn't provide, um, uh, especially in water like, you know, what Mike and Renee had out their back door, right? Um, the Henry's Fork. We've got flat water. Uh, you've got a ton of time for the trout to look at that. And you've got these really subtle sippers. They're not coming up and aggressively taking flies. Right. Um, and, and CDC can just get sucked down through that water uh, surface tension so much easier than hackle and you just get a much better hookup on those fish with cdc huh. in that kind of water the fly fishing film tour is back it's back again don't miss this year's f3t as it returns to theaters near you all sorts of good stuff and they've got a long list of shows that are just rolling right now we are about midway i think midway through the season and they've got a bunch more shows on on tap here I'm going to be listening uh, and watching the show. Uh, if it's March 24th for you and you're catching this right now, you can catch me at the Blue Mouse Theater up in Tacoma. So send me a DM or an email if you get a chance, and I would love to hook up with you and say hi. I'm going to be uh, trying to uh, maybe attend a few more of these if I can and would love to hear if, uh, if you're out there, if you're planning on attending a show, you can send me, like I said, DM or a message, Dave at Wetfly Swing. Let me know. I'd love to connect. Really excited to get back on some of these uh, local events and happy to share uh, what F3T has going this year. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash F3T to find a show near you and get some super dose of inspiration when planning that next big trip. That's wetflyswing.com slash F3T. Or you can just head over to flyfilmtour.com. Okay, back to the show. What would be the alternative if you weren't using CDC before it was CDC? What were people using? They were using dry fly hackles, right? And again, we didn't have dry fly hackles like we do now. And this is why Uncle bought Mets back in the 90s too, is to like mm. secure really great dry fly hackles for production and really wasn't about like consumers, right? It was like, we can't meet production with fine dry fly hackles. Uh, we need to just grow our own hackles for our own production. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, it was it, it, all, all pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, so you got a bunch of stories there and you talk to, it sounds like a bunch of the the greats and some stories. And then where could people find if they want to dig in and hear more of these stories? It sounds like you've got the 50th anniversary here. What's going on there? Yeah, so this is our 50th anniversary. If you guys want to hear more stories like this uh, and really get to see some of the stuff, like I'm staring at a picture now of, of Theo Bacalar, our gold bead man. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to see this stuff. Go to Uncle Feather Merchants uh, on Instagram or Facebook. Follow along. We're going to, starting in March, we're going to be posting these stories by decade, right? So you'll get to see what oh, okay. the 60s looked like and kind of our the early soulful beginnings of Uncle Feather Merchants, how that transitions into the 70s and, and a lot of the firsts that happened there. You get to see some really great cutoff shorts, wet wading the North Uncle River fishing for steelhead. <laughs> and then into the 80s yeah. and kind of that, that explosion we talked about and then some of those major innovations in the 90s and Unk was complete re-engineering in the in the two thousands and and really what that opened up for twenty ten and today right because um, yeah. yeah we moved from in in two thousand we moved from Lewis or sorry from uh, from Glide Oregon on the banks of the North Umpqua to Louisville Colorado and and really re-engineered the business to be able to you know make it to fifty years and and push forward another fifty right. Yeah, talk about that just briefly, and I want to dig a little more into some of the, a uh, little bit more of the history there, but that transition, so Glide, and for those that don't know Glide, isn't that the place that used to have the uh, the roadside, roadkill grill, or something like that, <laughs> right? Yeah, I'd, I've never been, but yes, I've heard stories. <laughs> there was, there was a roadkill grill, and uh, but it's just, I mean, Glide is a tiny town, and so describe what that was like, Glide, and that first, and then, and then why, and then how the transition happened. Yeah, as you might imagine, I mean, like, like Glide being a small town, right? Like, it got tough, right? Especially 
unfold, almost folded, right? And so, oh, wow. so you know, when you're at a business that's that it's at a point of not being su- successful anymore, there's layoffs that happen, right? And when you lay off people yeah. in a small town, they about want to choke you out right. when you go get your groceries, your gas pumped. And what year was that? What year was that, Russ? When it was struggling a bit? In in the late '90s, uh, and and so yeah, the the year that Google launched is the year Dennis Black sold Umpqua. Oh, wow. And then that's when an investment uh, capital group bought Umpqua Feather Merchants from Dennis. Gotcha. And that's at the point where, you know, you get someone that's really good at numbers and you say, this business is belly up. Like, right. And so they really started yeah. like, okay, we need to really cut costs, right? Uh, how do we, how do we save this thing? And so anyway, like, uh, and then the investment capital group was like, it's beyond us. Right. And one of the members of the investment capital group, uh, Hans Bosch, did the best thing ever for Umqua Feather Merchants that's ever happened. And Hans, Hans bought Umqua and relieved Umqua from its debt and said, let's go make this thing profitable. And, uh, and Jeff Fryover became CEO shortly thereafter, still our CEO. And Hans is still our majority owner. And, um, and after that, right. Uh, both of both Jeff and Hans said we we can't stay in Glide. We're not our most of our business is done in the Rockies uh, and our East Coast customers. We are like five days, seven days yeah. to get to them. Right. And so one of the first things they did is they they uploaded a list of all customers to um, to UPS, FedEx, right uh, at the time, and said, hey, uh, in order to best service our customers, where do you recommend we locate our business? And both of those two companies came back and they said, you should locate in Sydney, Nebraska. <laughs> and, and, and Jeff replied, he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's your second option? Second <laughs> option was Denver, Colorado, right? And that put us yeah. within two days of 90% of our customers. Right. And, and so that's where we kind of looked, uh, that's where they kind of looked for the new opportunity to move the business was, was to really service Umpus customers, uh, to continue to deliver great service and and that and that's what motivated the move to Colorado. None of us, uh, you know, I, I say none of us, right? Like, uh, but none of them wanted to be in Sydney, right? Like, this is a fly fishing company. Um, we wanted to be in the heart of it. And you know, the other thing that was such an advantage of Colorado, when you talk about like the reengineering of the business, you got to move. Colorado truly has some of the most innovative tires, and I mean this, no disrespect to other states innovative tires. Um, and it's, it's just because of the density of anglers, the sharing of ideas, the, the international airport, some of that stuff I talked about with Boulder, where like, I'm a permit nut. And you're just like, yeah, you can be, you've got an international airport here. You've exactly. got opportunity to make great money to, to be a permit junkie. Uh, cause that's not cheap. Right. And then, but that influence comes into like, Oh, like I like time permit flies and like, well, cool. That's a really cool concept. Like I'm, I'm going to wrap that into a trout bug. Uh, or, or bring this little piece over into my streamer. Um, so you get this like really big like blending of ideas. And, and so we got to have these incredible fly tires in our backyard to continue to drive that innovation right into the, as we re-engineered the company and, uh, you know, from then till now. Yeah, that is really cool. No, I love that story. And I know we're leaving a lot of holes, I think, uh, probably along the way. But uh, I did want to talk, you mentioned the the gold bead, the CDC Uh, Can you just describe a few more of those products that have come through Umqua over the years, going back to like the 70s that were kind of game changers? And these are some of the things it sounds like you highlight in that 50th. Yeah, I think uh, I think one of the biggest ones I'll do three and I'll uh, one one of the biggest ones is TMCO. And uh, because, right, production flies previously, if, if, if any of the listeners are out there who are who are old school fly tires, uh, the first thing you had to do, you open your box of mustads and you put a, a hook in yep. the vise and you sharpen it, <laughs> right? Like we don't, the, I guarantee you anyone in the last 20 years has no longer sharpened a hook uh, when they put it in the vise because that was the first thing you used to have to do as a tire, sharpen your hook yeah. uh, before you even start your thread. And and so Tiemco came out and, and the Tiemco story is super interesting. Uh, Ken Shimasaki is, is kind of a Tiemco's hooks founder. And Ken was working for Tiemco. Tiemco is a fly fishing brand um, in Japan. And mm-hmm. Ken was working for him as a young guy. And, and, and they have Yamami there. And Partridge was supplying Tiemco with hooks. 
And and Ken said to Partridge, he's like, hey, I've, I I really want a Yamame hook. You know, it's a it's such a unique hook for these fish and the style of flies we fish. And he 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 sent over some specs to Partridge. It would be great if it could look like this. And Partridge replied, and they said, this is this is impossible. You can't you can't do what you want with as fine of a wire as you want. And Ken said, I I don't believe that. And so he produced his own Yamame hook, um, which Tiemco then sold. And and then uh, with Japanese wire, right? And and because that that t- is one of the biggest things is is the 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 thinness and the strength of the wire and the forging that happens there. And so Ken said, "Well, I'm a fly tire. Like, I'm going to do a couple other designs." And and Tiemco encourages, "Say, hey, well, this is your this is your thing now, Ken." And uh, and so Ken Ken designed the f- four models of Tiemco hooks. And they're still Tiemco's four most popular hooks: the 100, the 101, the 200R, and the 300. And and that was what what was first offered in 19 da, 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 1983 uh, for mm-hmm. Umqua, and and that just changed the game as far as just like you know the the chemically sharpened hook. They just stuck better than anything you could fish. You know, like you caught more fish on Tiemco because they just like grabbed the fish's mouth for like that millisecond longer than a uh than a traditional sharpened hook um and then that forging so you could have a uh, very thin wire right so great dry fly hooks that floated better right uh and still held when you got big fish and same thing held true with nymph hooks right and, and the shapes were built for fly tires right and so um it was uh it, that was a massive one was tm going and dennis black you know it was one of those things that you know, as an angler, Dennis became uh, really a world traveler. He loved to to travel and meet people, and uh, this was a, a happened uh, happening, right? That Dennis ran into Ken Shimasaki, and and uh, and it. you know, uh, so Umqua is uh, Tiemco's North American distributor, exclusive, uh, and. And we work to this day with Ken Shimazaki still. Oh wow! And and Ken Ken does not do spreadsheets. He does not do CAD drawings. It's a rough translation, but he says I think by hand, meaning I design everything in hand. So when we design like the we have a new you know the four hundred three BLJ jig hook, right? Yeah. Ken doesn't do Ken does a drawing by hand, and then bends it by hand, and he says I like hmm. this shape. This is the shape. And then test the shape, uh, and he may bend, you know, a dozen, a dozen variations of the same shape, right, of his idea, and uh, and and in his words, he says the first one's usually the best, um, but I do a dozen, and then I take him to the water, test him, and uh, before we start to explore the sizes, and and that was one of the other things that Tiemco that I, I I can't glaze over, they set a standard, right, so. Previous to Tiemco, there wasn't ever like 1x long, 2x long, 3x long, and the hook gap in relation to the shank length, right? Uh, so Ken said, one of the problems we're going to solve as a fly tire is I want consistency as we go through this line. So when you pick up a size 18, there's a there's a, a shank length that can be measured and a, a hook gap relative to that shank length. So we can standardize 18s, right, or 16s, so blah, 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 um, which again – Prior to that, it was kind of like model to model. You really had to know your models because like, oh, an 18 in this is really a 16 in this model uh, or a 14, right? There wasn't that same level of like, if I grab an 18, I know I'm tying 18s. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I remember I remember when TMCO came in and it was just a whole nother level. I remember, yeah, you're right. Like you said, it was all mustad. It was just mustad everywhere. And then this Tiemco was like, wow, this is a, a totally different deal, you know, just the whole package. And and it's and it's been to this day. Now there's tons of right great hook brands, a lot more out there than there were. But at the time, was it just Tiemco at that when you're talking like this is what like the eighties, right? Yeah, this was the early eighties. Yeah, Tiemco Daiichi would have been right around the same time. Oh, Daiichi. But um yeah. but Tiemco was the first like true hey you know, fly tying, fly tire hooks, uh, where Daiichi found that niche afterwards. Right. And, and that, that story of Ken really trying to develop, develop hooks through another manufacturer. Right. You know, it just wasn't, wasn't being done. And, and so, yeah, that, the Tiemco was a, Tiemco was a really big one. And then that rolled into production. And so instantly when you bought Umqua flies, not only were they being tied out of like materials that a fly tire right. would tie with, now they're being tied with these new revolutionary hooks. 
And so, so, you know, Umpqua has always been the most expensive flies in the bin. Um, and that's just because we've TM or sorry, Umpqua has always rested on the best, the highest quality, no compromise. Right. And, and just even like the way we put production flies into, or sorry, um, signature flies into production is like, we tie them to the tire specs and like, the tire says we've got to use Arctic Fox. Well, Arctic Fox is really expensive, but nothing. There's no real substitute for Arctic Fox, so we use Arctic Fox and it, and uh, and and proportions like right. So we use we use tires. We use their knowledge of their flies, right? Because anyone who really ties flies understands it's like, well, I use this because it does this, or I like this property of that material, like. So anyway, uh, TMCO was, was massive. I don't think we can understate that as far as like what it did for Umqua. And in the, in the early 80s, Umqua alongside Orvis um, and Dan Bailey were the first to re- release fluorocarbon. Oh, wow. And alongside Orvis were the first to release uh, an extruded tapered leader. And all of Umqua's original extruded taper leaders that were released were all Dave Whitlock uh, leader designs, which was super cool. So again, you know, prior to, uh, to 1982, you couldn't get, you had to hand tie all your leaders. There was no knotless, oh, right. you know, extruded leaders that, you know, dissipated energy or transferred energy. Well, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was really cool as like a, a first and Ed Schroeder tells this amazing story about, um, about trying to secure that fluorocarbon and those leaders, uh, from, uh, from a Japanese gentleman. And he was working for both Umqua and Orvis as a rep at the time. And, and again, like if I, 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 said, I said, alongside Orvis, Dan Bailey had the first formulation. They were selling – this Japanese company was selling three formulations of this new fluorocarbon material, right? And Dan Bailey bought the cheapest one. And who knows if that's true or not, right? That like there were quality differences between the three. Right. But uh, Dennis Black said, I go secure it Ed, and don't come back unless you've secured it. And, uh, and so he went to the AFMA show, which is pre IFTD and, and Ed, uh, Ed essentially was, uh, he's like, dude, I cannot find these guys. And he's like, Ed, you won't have a job unless you come home with that formulation, dude. (laughs) So anyway, it finally, these guys walk up to Ed in the Orvis booth and they say, Hey, we want to, and, and, and Ed's, uh, you know, VP of sales is standing next to him. He said, Oh, we want to talk to you guys. We've got this new material and, and Ed's like freaking out. And, and finally as his VP walks away and he says, he says, I am also with Umqua, hands him a card, and, and you know, it's a, it's a father and son, and they're translating because uh, the father doesn't speak uh, English, and they're translating back and forth. And the son looks, and he said, this is – we don't understand. This is not how business is done. Um, you know, are you Orvis? And he said, no, 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 no. Like, like, don't worry. Uh, our, our founder, Dennis Black, he wants to speak with you, da, 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 da. And they're going back and forth. They were like, look, look, no, 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 no. And he said, hey, here, Ed says, here's the deal. I can have you catching steelhead tomorrow. If you get on a plane with me, I will fly you and we'll catch steelhead tomorrow and you can talk with Dennis. And they go back and forth. Bah, 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 bah. And, uh, and the father, first word of English he speaks, steelhead. And so Dave ushers him out of the, the hall, uh, you know, gets him on a plane. He's like, he's like, I, fin- I felt like I was kidnapping him in the process of this. Right. And uh, ushers him out of the hall, gets him on a plane. They go, they go catch steelhead. Umqua gets this formulation, uh, you know, and then, you know, Ed's boss follows up. Well, what happened to the two guys? Ah, I have no idea. It's like, I don't think my boss knows that story to the, you know, to this day. Nice. Uh, so that was a big one for Umqua. And then, and I think, yeah. I think the biggest one, or not the biggest, but another really big one that I think is uh, overlooked was, was, was quality of flies. Right. And, um, yeah. you know, back in the eighties when we were dealing with, with fly quality and QC, it was all, you'd get it in. And at the time, Dave Hall was the fly guy, and he was an artist. And you get into flies, and he's like, ah, geez, they, they put this on wrong, or this isn't quite right. And he'd do a drawing of it, right, of how it should be, and then send it, mail it back to the factory. Well, you could imagine in the time that it took to get the flies, do the drawing, send it back, how many dozens of flies were produced wrong, right? So you had like right. these huge – the fax machine was one of the, again, the really oh, wow. big pieces. Oh, we just got these. I draw it right now and I fax it over to you and like halt production. And so Umqua's yep. quality like exploded uh, alongside mm. TMCO and everything like that, right? And it was largely oh, wow. because of the fax machine that, again, one of those little overlooked uh, pieces of technology that was like, oh, that, yeah, that I could see how that's, that's helpful. Huge. 
but yeah, that's uh, there's there's a ton of really cool stuff. Uh, again, for the listeners out there that want to hear more of this stuff and really kind of understand uh, some of the history of of fly fishing in the last fifty years, head on over to Uncle Feather Merchant's social media. Uh-huh. Instagram will probably be one of the more fun formats. We'll do this. We just we just did an awesome little Gary LaFontaine video uh, just yesterday as a little teaser. You guys can check out. Oh, cool. But yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's a great history. It's a lot of fun to follow along. So definitely follow us and, and never miss out on one of these. Yeah, we'll do that. No, that's awesome. I love to take this further and I still have a, a ton of questions. So, you know, we won't get into them all today, but I do want to dig just quickly into some of the competitive fishing because we always have a lot of questions there and people are always interested in kind of the Euro nymphing stuff. So just give us a quick little snippet on. So you're still doing the competitive fishing stuff? I am. You know, we haven't had the same number of tournaments in the last couple of years that we have in the past. Uh, and and yes, yeah, so I'm on the U.S. national team um, and uh, I've been to, I don't remember if it's five or six world championships. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, it's it's been awesome to be a part of um, and and truly like eye opening for how much you can learn. Uh, and that's been my biggest motivation of this whole thing. You know, I, I, I understand people have a hard time grasping why you would ever want to compete, uh, fly fishing, right? Like it's what I do for relaxation. I totally get it. You could, you could apply the same logic to golf, right? Um, uh, you want to do it. You want to, you want to, you know, go out and and play golf at a high level and and enroll in a tournament because you want to push yourself and see what you're capable of. Um, it's the same thing when it comes to competitive fly fishing. And, and for me, right. If, if I'm not, if I don't have a, a goal in mind, I don't push myself as hard. Right. Yeah, and so, that's right. uh, so there were a lot of years where I was ultra motivated to like really find out as much as I could. Uh, and so I, I had to kind of set, set myself up for that and, uh, and fish a lot of tournaments as a result of it around the country. And it's, it's been awesome. You meet a ton of really passionate anglers, um, and, uh, and you get to fish a lot of places that you wouldn't normally fish. And, you certainly fish a lot of pieces of water that you would never, never, ever, ever, ever fish. Uh. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, like uh, we were just talking. We had uh, one of the folks, uh, Erlen from Team Norway, on. We did an episode, and and he talked about you know some of the same thing over there. I think they're just getting going back with some of the European uh, yep. tournaments and things like that. But so does it look? How's it looking this year? Is it looking like maybe things are going to get going again? Yeah, we're 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 gonna be uh, we're sending a squad over to um, to Spain this year, uh, which will be awesome. And we've got a a team practice in April, uh, kind of preparing for that. Um, I won't be going over this year to to Spain, but uh, we're gonna be working with the guys um, who are gonna be going over there. So we're we've got a team practice in April. So we're you know we've got some mini events that we're we're lining out. We're changing the way we do the cycle a little bit. Um, uh, for more smaller kind of like uh, local one day events to kind of invite some more participation, and then uh, from those little local events, we we can then kind of have a because these these tournaments were selling out in like two minutes, right? So these are local events you guys are doing here, getting prepared for the tournament. Yeah, and then and then that rolls into like a regional event. So like you know all these people that did like. Um, uh, competed within like a, a certain region of the country, then get to qualify to go up into these regionals and that rolls into a national. Uh, and then they select the world team and, and the team from that national list. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So there's a whole process there of, so you have some people like the, you know, Devin Olson's and some folks that have, um, you know, that are on the yep. team or, and I'm not even sure, maybe you could talk about that. Do you have a, a like some people that are on now and then you're going to add some more during this tournament process? So yeah, this would be the way to think about this would be like uh, like race race cars. Like uh, you get a a point total for the season, right? And so certain certain tournaments, certain races are worth more points, uh, are heavily weighted, right? And so like our nationals is is weighted a lot more, or uh, a, like an international event like Canada does a number of of events that um, that they invite you know people from the U.S. and uh, overseas, and so those are worth a little bit more and you know, the idea is you end up, uh, the people who do well consistently across a number of them 
have more points. And then we select a team of 15. The top three point earners automatically uh, get onto uh, the world team. And then they vote on another three from the list of 15, kind of based on, you know, strengths and weaknesses of the angler and how that would compare to uh, potential world venues, right? Because some guys are like, gotcha. You know, we have anglers like in North Carolina that don't have as many kind of lakes like we might have out here in the West. Yeah. And they're, yeah. they're some of the mo most unbelievable river anglers you've ever met. Like, uh, and that, that would hold true for Pennsylvania as well. Like, uh, like Pat Weiss is one of the best, yeah. he's one of the best river anglers I've ever seen in my life. Um, I, I jokingly call him the wizard. Like that dude can, yeah. he's like, Oh, you see that rock that has a little shadow on it over the bank there. And I was like in the frog water. He's like, yeah, he's like, there's a, he's like, there's a brown trout sitting under there. I was like, yeah, I'm sure there is, man. Plunk in a single nymph and let it settle to the bottom. Doop. Just jig it once. Brown trout races out from underneath that rock, eats it, and like, I was like, I was like, oh, wow. are you kidding me? I was like, what is this? <laughs> uh, I mean, like, that's yeah. the level of 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 an angler that he is, and he's great on the lakes, right? Yeah. But like, he doesn't have access to. So anyway, we we try to pats on the team, but uh, we try to always yeah. pick anglers based on that and yeah devin you mentioned devin like you know guys like devin lance egan i mean they've been on top of the pile for a dec a decade yeah. right? right like uh those guys have structured their life so they can go yep. fish and and they're they're really good at it the crc system from trestle provides secure convenient storage for your fully rigged fly rods Every CRC system comes with uh, secure mounting clamps, padding in the reel compartment, and their proprietary suspended rod liners. This setup allows you to leave your gear on your vehicle full time, or you can telescope it down into carry mode in just a few minutes. CRC, this system is equipped with a padded protective no snag reel up design, and it is definitely not your average rod carrier. Uh, some of the good uh, features here with the rods uh, the reels facing up actually protects your reel uh, better in the compartment. But all sorts of good stuff here. You're going to have to check it out for yourself. You can head over to uh, Trestle right now. That's wetflyswing.com slash Trestle. T-R-X-S-T-L-E. And you can support this podcast by clicking it over to that link right now and see what Trestle has going. Okay, let's get back to the show. It's amazing because it's, you know, when I think of it, I always go back to the NBA because there's a time in my life when I was like, all right, I want to be in the NBA. You know, that's that's my goal. And uh, and it's literally like there's 300 people that are professional, you know, NBA players. Right. So it's almost zero percent chance to do it. And and it's kind of similar here. I mean, you've got a small number of people that do this. Right. So what would you tell somebody who's out there maybe on the junior team or just is interested? Is this something, you know, a realistic goal to kind of shoot for? Well, I think it, 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 it's a realistic goal to shoot for if you want that personal fulfillment. No one's getting paid for this. Uh, there's only costs associated with it. So uh, hmm. as long as it's something that fulfills you, absolutely you should go do it. But just be realistic and like you're not getting Nike signing you up and you're going to get a set of Jordans right. with your name on it. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, there's yeah. – uh, I, I don't – Maybe you should get to that. Maybe I could see that, like uh, Orvis sponsoring. You know that that's kind of interesting, right? It's it's just not that's not what it is, right? It, this is more about the fishing. It's and, and even though the competitive fishing has taken a hit, right? It seems like sometimes people are like, "Why do I want a competitive fish?" But that's the interesting thing, right there, right? It's not about the money. This is just about a love of of the sport. Love the sport, and once you get to go to a couple world championships and meet other world anglers that are, you know, at the same level as you, as as, as the love for that. You get to, I mean, you're, you know, we, we all become friends on Facebook and like, I don't know how many people from around the globe as the pandemic kind of closed in on everyone just reached out. Have you been fishing? What are you doing? Is, is your family safe? Like, you know, it's a, it's an awesome community outside of that, right? That's, that's worth the price of admission, right? Which is an insane amount of time and an insane amount of money because like, Again, when you're trying to like have like a 10% difference or a 1% difference over someone, because what's happened now, uh, because of the way of the world, right? We've got great podcasts, videos, social media, like these techniques. When I started, uh, again, Rob Kalanda sitting at Front Range Anglers, uh, you think you're pretty good, you should come out in one of these. 
he was a mentor of self-discovery. He's like, well, I was like, I went out today. I did, I, here's what I did. He's like, yeah, I'm surprised you didn't try that. You're like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you should try that next time. I was like, what, what, what does that mean? He's like, well, just try it. Like I had to figure it out. You know what I mean? Uh, and that's how he, you know, that was his style, which is fine. Now everything's kind of out there. Like a lot of the stuff that, uh, that we used to get our faces pounded in by the other European teams, like, uh, like the, the idea of a micro leader, right? Um, I'm sure you guys have talked about that. Mm -hmm. That was five years ago. There were a handful of people in the United States that knew about that. I kid you not. And now it's Mm -hmm. like, here's a video on it. Here's one that's like available, you know, uh, out of a package, yeah, it just uh, so now you have to go look for what are what are my ten percent differences, right? Like, and and so it's like, all right, well, if I'm that invested in it, I want to make sure all of my gear is perfect. I want to make sure all of my flies are perfect. I want to make sure I'm using the right hooks. Like, so you end up buying a lot of stuff, and and there's a lot of stuff. I there's boxes of flies that I've tied that I like. I don't like that hook as much anymore, and like I'll never fish those flies again. Right, <laughs> and yep. so it's like That's right. all new flies. And the amount of time to tie an all new set of flies on a, on a hook that I like that may trend out in my mind in a number of years. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, I wouldn't, I would say do it for the love of it. And if something comes of it, that's excellent. Right. And that's fabulous. And if nothing comes of it more than, than lifelong friendships and a yeah. deeper knowledge of fishing, that should be enough to fulfill you. That's it. That's it. That's good. Well, we're going to get out of here pretty quick, Russ, but I had a question. I, had, I can't leave you without asking one marketing question. So I'm curious. This is kind of a funny one, but the, uh, and you said Facebook a number of times, the, the metaverse, are you guys, is that on your, uh, are you thinking about that at all? Like literally that whole thing? Cause it just seems like kind of a crazy world. And I don't even know where it's at to be honest with you, man. No, no, I'm not thinking no. about it. Okay, good. What I want to think about doing more of are more in-person events, right? Like people connecting with people. I think, yeah. I don't know. I, we did a lot of, uh, we're in our third season of, of our, of our live fly time. Right. And our first season was awesome, you know, cause everyone was at home staring at their phones anyway. Like we were all addicted to, to the news. We probably still are, but like, yep. um, you know, even that, like, I think people are wanting more, more in-person after all this virtual stuff. Yeah. And, and I know the needles in the arm, right? Like, uh, we all got really addicted to everything in that world, but you know what? Our sports really, I, the, the things that have the biggest lasting impression on me from our sport are, are, are in-person events that I've had, uh, and I've had with other people and I've had with a little community. And so we're, we're going to start doing and, and would like to do more of is investing in like community events where we can physically get together and learn from one another. Cause there's just a lot of learning that doesn't happen in a virtual space. Um, so we're, dude, we're not meta going into the metaverse, we're not buying a uncle Good. storefront. <laughs> uh, yeah. but we're still going to be active on social media. It's a great way to, it really is a great way to just kind of have a, a message board where people can keep in touch. And, and like I said, like, you know, all those international anglers, right. You know, it's just, it's a great, it's a great tool when it's used correctly. And so we just try to, if you ever follow our stuff, uh, we really try to celebrate the great parts about the sport. Um, the fish are secondary in a lot of cases. Exactly. No, that's, I love that answer. Okay. So we got a couple of just, uh, this is the ask a pro section and we got a couple of, uh, we're not going to dig in all, obviously today when I have enough time to go all into the Euro nymphing, but I got some a couple of random questions from folks in the Facebook group. And one of them comes up quite a bit. This is a, kind of interesting. I'm from a new angler. So you got somebody out there that's just, this was from Leslie in the Facebook group. And she was saying, you know, just finding out where to go. Right. So mm. somebody's kind of new to it. They're getting started and they don't even know you know, they could be in whatever state or whatever country. What do you tell somebody that's kind of like, man, where do I kind of, where do I go? Where do I start? Yeah. Well, I think there's two really great things you can do. One, uh, and the first one kind of uh, the, both these answers piggyback back off our last question. Mm-hmm. I would go to your local fly shop Yeah, and that's like, you've got a built in community there. They're literally there to help service you. They'd like to invite you into their world and what they do and expose you to all of those local opportunities. So I would first start at your local fly shop. And then the beauty really of this online world we're on is there's there's probably a community page on Facebook for just about every little thing. Right. And and so yeah, connect with some folks online. Don't be afraid to be new. And I think that's like, again, one of the things I've learned through competitive fly fishing is like, check your ego. I was fishing with some of the guys. We were fishing up on 
up on the Roaring Fork, and my buddy was into fish a lot better than I was. And I was like, dude, I was like, dude, yeah, yeah. First, I asked him what he was fishing. He's like, da da da. And I was like, cool. I was not getting into him. I was on the other side of the river, and he was, you know, we were facing each other, working upstream. Yeah. And I was like, all right, just just stop and watch me for a second. Like, what am I doing wrong? You know, and he had just he was like, I don't know, nothing, nothing crazy, but like. Uh, but like, I, I think, I think we're all afraid not to be an expert immediately. Yeah. Like, I, I think don't be afraid to be new. I, one of the advantages of when I was new, there wasn't social media. So there wasn't someone that was ready to like tear your head off. Cause like you no. did something wrong. Like, sure. Right. I did some unethical things. Like I did, I could have treated fish better. Right. Um, but I didn't yep. put that on social media, but like, I think, I think we're afraid of, of being new anymore and, and don't be afraid to be yeah. new. We're all, we're all new. And try new, exactly. And try new thing. That's always something I tend to, you know, sometimes in the past get stuck in. Like you got this thing that's working, you know. You mentioned, you alluded to it a few times today, but you know, try something new too, right? Mix it up. Try a, you know, try a gold bead or something, you know, different. Totally. Yeah, and, and like when I first started Euro nymphing, like again that learning process I went through, I I knew I was catching less fish. I was not catching more fish. That oh, was like the biggest yeah. lie that I was gonna like. Oh, you're like. You're gonna catch all these fish and just like make it rain. I would fish sections of water that I knew. And I was like, I caught less fish today than if I had just run a dry dropper through there. And why was that? Because you're it seems like now you just grab a Euro rod and you're hundred percent gonna catch more fish. That's what they that's what you think. Yeah. That's what you've been told, right? And, yeah. and then when you don't do that, you're like, Well, I must really suck. Yeah. You know, and 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 so like I, I think again, like it's not afraid to don't don't be afraid to be new, don't be afraid to to get worse and invest the time to get better and and now I'm confident that with my Euro rod, I can outfish what I was doing before. No question. And there's a handful of scenarios where, you know, dry dropper or, you know, traditional indicator style nymphing is going to be. But like, man, I, if I were to go back and roll back the clock to like that, that cocky kid that knew it all back in college uh, and post-college, I'm confident the rust of today goes and beats him. There you go. Yep. I mean, well, it's always, you know, I mean, like all of us, right? Keep learning. That's what we love about fly fishing is always to, you're learning your whole life. I mean, do you feel like even though you're at the top of your game now, do you feel like you still have a ton to learn? Oh my gosh. Uh, one of the, one of the coolest things about getting to work in the industry, uh, and, and, you know, I've, I've worked for, for, for Sage, uh, for Fish Pond uh-huh. and for Umqua, you get to meet some unbelievably talented people, people that are the best at what they do. And like, you know, I like to, I, I like to consider myself an angler and by my definition of an angler, it means you're, you're very well rounded, right? Like you can do a lot mm-hmm. of things, a lot of things very well. And then you meet someone and I was like, wow, there's a, there's yeah. a level of this I did not even know about. Like you have thought about something I hadn't even considered and not only thought about it, but like explored it to the 10th degree. And, and so, yeah, like, uh, I do not feel like I'm at the top of my game. Like, uh, because I'm, I, I constantly meet someone like that and you're just like, it's yeah. unbelievable what you've done. You might be one of one that have done that, but that is an unbelievable insight that you, you've, you've gardened from that. Right. Yeah. That's a cool take. Well, let's do one more. I got one more quick one. This one's a common question that comes up a lot and maybe you can apply it to your own nymphing. Cause I think the line, you know, casting is a little challenge. So if you got wind out there, that's that somebody's battling. What would you tell somebody that's struggling with the wind? Any, any tips there? And could you apply that to like the Euro game where you're trying to cast that line, which is also a struggle for some? Yeah. Yeah. It's a wind's a tough one, man. Well, uh, first thing I would do is practice my casting, um, Euro rod or not. I would, I would spend yeah. time in the yard, uh, or a field and just practice casting. You never right. get good at casting while you're fishing. And it's, because we're focused on fishing. It's the end result we're focused on when we're fishing, right? Yep. When you just go out and practice, you can then work on the skills uh, because casting is the one element you can control in any scenario. And that's why I like to be as good at it as I can be. Like salt water, steelhead, like uh, Euro nymphing, right. drive life fishing, any scenario, windy, flat calm. Like huh. it is. Can you do that in the yard, Russ, on, uh, with the Euro rod? Is that, is, can you also practice in your yard? Um, I never have. Yeah. It's kind of hard, right? Cause you need the, your lot of the cast you're doing is using the water load, right? To flip it up. I don't use the water load. Um, but when I'm Euro nymphing, I rely on the same basic casting principles 
that a, a regular weight forward fly line or double plate taper fly line would have, right? Um, so the principles remain the same. It's where you apply the power. It's you know how you use your rod angles that change with the euro rod. Um, but the same basic casting principles apply. You can't cheat physics. And so if you get good at casting a single-handed rod or a double-handed rod or just casting, right, those will apply to your own nymphing, right? So that would be my first uh, tip on wind. It's just get good at casting because okay. if you're good at casting, you're going to be able to deliver through the wind, right, as, at a higher level, right? It still might not be perfect, but it'll be yeah. a significantly higher level than it was previously. Gotcha. And again, on that, go into your local fly shop, find somebody. If you can't do that, what, watch some videos online or what? what do you yeah, I, I think work with, uh, so I went, uh, I went through the FFI program. I never completed it because COVID came in. Um, and, and, uh, and I never picked it back up just cause life hasn't slowed down since then. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, I got to work with a mentor for two years and, and he, I thought, again, I thought after working at Sage, I was like, I'm a pretty good caster. We right. completely retooled my casting stroke and oh, I am no kidding. way better caster now. Even after you were in, this is after you were a team or in the team USA. Oh, for sure. For sure. That's a great thing. That's cool. So I would, I would work with someone, um, uh, who's an FFI certified casting instructor. That would be the first thing I'd do. Uh, and if you mm -hmm. didn't want to kind of, uh, step up to that, my Volvo commit, there's been a ton of amazing online resources. Um, the only thing you find someone credible, reputable, um, uh, that just isn't telling you how great they are, but they are demonstrating how great they are online. Uh, you know, if you're going to watch YouTube and stuff like that. And then uh, to, to answer the second part of your question on wind with the Euro rod. Oh, right. So one of the ways you can battle wind with the Euro rod, I'd probably say three things. The first thing would be you can change the way you're fishing, and that's where the indicator can win, right? Like, So I will fish like a dry double dropper if it's legal in your state. Um, and go back to that, like, use the surface tension of the water to anchor your whole rig, Right. Uh, and so you get that same strike detection, you'll watch, you know, you'll be watching your indicator dry fly. So that's, that's, that's tip number one. Tip number two, uh, a micro leader becomes really great because it's just less, you know, it's more aerodynamic in the wind. It's thinner. It's less surface to be pulled around. Is that what, describe that again for somebody that doesn't know the micro leader. How, how is that different than just your normal leader? Yeah. Great question, Dave. Uh, a micro leader would be like fishing, uh, four X, right? So like instead of like a, a thicker, like a lot of Euro leaders start with like a, a 20 pound butt or like um, a 16, 12, maybe even eight would be light. This whole thing is for, you know, a four pound test essentially, right? Four X, like it's very thin. Uh, and so it, it just doesn't get blown around quite as much in the wind, right? Uh, so that's an advantage. And the third advantage that I do uh, is I'd overweight my flies. I put on the heavier stuff to just help hold that rig down and provide a little extra tension. Um, so it doesn't get blown around as much. Now it changes your presentation. So your fly choice kind of has to, has to do that. And I, I end up have, fishing heavier flies and then jigging them a little bit more, um, just to make sure I've got good contact and I'm anchoring that whole system. So that's, that's the way I combat wind is, is kind of those three methods. That's it. That's it. That's awesome. All right, Russell, this one, you know, I think we were obviously just touched the surface on, on the Euro stuff. And uh, I, I'm curious where, I mean, we've talked a lot. We've mentioned some of the people, the great resources out there. If somebody wanted to dig more into Euro, do you have a place that you go to, you know, learn more about it? Where, where, where would you send somebody? Yeah, I think, um, you know, my good friends, Lance Egan, Devin Olson have both have a ton of resources on this. They probably, you know, they've got their modern nymphing DVD. Yeah. Uh, Devin's yeah. got a new book, tactical fly fisher. That's right. Um, or, or tactical fly fishing. Sorry. That's his business is tactical fly fisher. Exactly. And Lance is doing some stuff too out there. He's got some, I just been watching some videos and he's doing some cool stuff as well. So, yeah. And then George Daniel, he used to be the uh, coach of the U S team. Oh yeah. And, uh, George has, is another great resource. And was he there with you? Were you there when he was there? Yeah, we went to the Czech Republic together. He was uh, that was uh, he was as a coach at the time. I stepped in right as George was stepping out. Okay, yeah, his book. Uh, what was his book? That early book that really was a, put a lot of great information out there. Dynamic nymphing. I've got it right in front That's of right. me on my bookshelf. In fact, 
Yeah, that's still a good one, isn't it? That's still got a ton of good resources, uh, just all right. It was just packed. Absolutely, absolutely. All this stuff. And, and if you look at... If you look at all of those books, and this is kind of what I've been dancing around a little bit, if you look at all that stuff, man, they are focused on basics and executing those basics extremely well. And so, like, I think we can get caught up in all of this other stuff, especially when it comes to Euro nymphing, yeah. because it's right. it's still not quite as commonplace. And so, focus on basics and just get really good at those basics, and then start to introduce more uh, complexity. And you'll find versus introducing a ton of complexity. You find your frustration level goes down a little bit. Cool, Russ. Well, anything you want to give a heads up in for you the next year that's coming for anything new uh, we could think either personally or professionally? Yeah. Um, well, first, uh, yeah, Umqua's got uh, the, our 50th anniversary stuff's going to be super cool. Follow along there. We're doing. When's that start up? Uh, in March. So. Oh, in March. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So it's pretty soon. So definitely check us out there. And man, personally, Personally, I've been living my life off the grid. I haven't been doing a ton of social media. Uh-huh. But uh, if you ever see me on the water, definitely stop and say hello. Uh, bug me. I'm, as you can see, I'm a talker. That's right. <laughs> what's your What's your home? Do you have a uh, home water one that we don't we don't have to give secrets away? Is there? One oh man, I I love Cheeseman Canyon more than about anything else, and yeah, it's no secret. A, uh, yeah. I, you can find me crawling around in there most weekends. So if you see me, stop and say hello. That's cool. Uh, no, that's really good. So that's one of the the tough places to fish, right? That one you you you're making your pay if you're getting fish there, right? Yeah, it, there are days where it's it feels real easy. There are days where you're like, I know nothing anymore. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, it's a that's humbling awesome. place. Right on. All right, Russ. We'll send everybody. I guess on Instagram, it's a uh, Miller RP. Yeah. Want to find you? Miller RP. If you guys want to find me, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you would have specifically. So yeah, Miller RP on Instagram and then Umqua Feather Merchants professionally. And yep. yeah, I, I thank you guys for making it all the way. Hopefully you, you learned a couple things uh, in here. Oh yeah. Yeah. This is, we, we just touched the service. The dipping was so, or, you know, just the, that was a short step, but the Umqua was the bulk for me. You know, I love those stories. I mean, going back to Randall Kaufman, his name, he was so huge. I mean, you look at the travel stuff. I mean, all those names that we glossed over, right? There's probably probably hundreds of people who, you know we could have talked about here today. But uh, I appreciate you shedding light on that. And yeah, I hope to keep in touch with you. Maybe maybe down the line we'll get you back on and dig more into the uh, the competitive stuff. Well, Dave, thank you so much for having me on. And uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all links, and everything else we covered today, head over to webflyswing.com slash 303. 303 will get you every link we had here today. And you can dig in deeper, get some photos, get some video, a little bit of everything. If you get a chance, head over to webflyswing.com slash fly shop. And you can check out and support our local fly shop right now. And uh, if you have a fly shop in mind that you are loving, please send me a message and let me know. I'd love to connect with them. Stay tuned uh, and subscribe. Tuesday, Tuesday, we've got a Golden Dorado episode. This one's good. Nick Torres is here to break down his uh, recent trip over there, and he walks us through what it takes to get into Golden Dorado, including all the crazy animals that are out in this part of the world. So this one's pretty awesome just for that, to hear some of the stories there. So if you want to get updated when that episode goes live, you can click your subscribe button, and that'll drop right into your phone just like magic. I want to thank you for sticking around today. I appreciate you for listening to the show and for uh, supporting us and supporting your journey. Hope to see you online or on the water. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.